Today I'm going to cover the respiratory system and it does make sense if you haven't already done so to review the cardiovascular system. There are labs available on the website that I've uh, put up for your convenience. It's at the link to, below at their description. But when we're dealing with the respiratory system, it, like I said, it does help to go back to the basics of respiration. So if we start in the right atrium, we can see the blood is coming in from the body, so it's deoxygenated. It goes to the right ventricle. Right ventricle, it goes through the pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries, to the capillaries, back to the pulmonary veins, into the left atrium, to the left ventricle, to the body, and the process returns over and over again. So, big thing that does happen is we do have things going from arteries to arterioles to what are called met arterioles, which can control the blood flow into the capillaries and gastric change can occur and then it goes through the venules. Now most of this is driven by either diffusion or osmosis. In nutrition, we, in uh, digestion, we will actually go back to this to absorb nutrients, but for now well, let's deal with just the gases. Now one thing to remember is the pressure is not equal in all the blood vessels. As blood vessels branch, they actually maintain even though they get smaller, they maintain more space in the lumen, which means if you remember the equation P1V1 equals P2V2, as you get more space, you have more volume, and so the pressure will increase. And so you do have a lot of different things that are acting on that. Now, there's also other pressures that occur. Some pressures are under, some vessels are under pressure because of hydrostatic pressure. If you think of standing, the veins in your leg will actually have more pressure because they're working against gravity. This is, a, this is going to cause a pulling pressure and it can push fluids out. You also do have uh, osmotic pressure pulling stuff back in. For instance, proteins dissolved, proteins within the blood are going to pull things back. And there's a small but constant leaking that occurs which gets back to the circulation via lymphatics. Now there are different fluid compartments. So the best way to look at this is to take a sample of blood and spin it in a tube, centrifugation. And what ends up happening is you have three areas. You have an area that's gonna be dark red, you have a clear white area, a area that's a little white called the buffy coat, and then you have the area above, which is clear, called the uh, plasma. So you have the plasma, the buffy coat, and the formed elements. Now, if you take the this and we look at the body compartments, this would be your vascular, and your vascular system is pretty much going to be part of your, well, it will be part of your interstitial fluid. You will actually have your total uh, fluid in your body, and you can divide it into the interstitial, which will make up, a, make up about 80% of the extracellular uh, fluid. You then have your plasma, which, which makes up 20% of the extracellular fluid. And then you have your intercellular, which makes up most of the fluid. Extracellular fluid makes up about 20% of total body weight. A lot of this is going to be inside cells. So you have more fluid inside of your cells than in everywhere else. If you think of the total body of total body weight of intercellular fluid is about 40% the extracellular is only about 20%. So most of it is going to be intracellular. And so what ends up happening is, if we were to draw intracellular, interstitial, which is a, the fluid around the, the, then I know this isn't even, uh, the fluid around the cells, fluid within the cells will actually go back and forth between the cells and intercellular, and the interstitial, the interstitial will bounce back and forth in the intervascular. And so you have this, shifting. As there's more fluid in the cells, it acts, this area tends to act like a buffer. It doesn't allow certain things to actually change. So if you actually look at the diffusion of carbon dioxide from tissues to intercellular, the tissues actually produce the carbon dioxide, breaking down sugar and other molecules. It goes into the interstitial fluid. From the interstitial fluid, it'll go to the plasma, and in the plasma, it may bind to the red blood cells, which will convert it to carbonic acid, bind to hydrogen, and have bicarbonate back into the plasma. If we're looking at oxygen in a active tissue, we have high levels of oxygen in the red blood cells, 
it will end up going into the plasma, the oxygens, and pla from the plasma and interstitial fluid, and then into cells. So you don't have this massive change within the intercellular concentration. One thing to remember, about, again, about the fluid compartments, it, they act as a buffer. They allow little changes to occur. Now over here again, you can see how the capillaries, the uh, arteries will go into arterioles, to metarterioles, and then the capillaries, and then into the venules. So you can see how in the tissues, gas exchange will occur, nutrient exchange, and fluid will ch change. Now, because of how things move, the, uh, the blood moving through it, pressures and proteins, and also salt con content, a lot of times you will have leakiness in the capillaries, and that leakiness is picked up by lymphatic capillaries. Now that we actually went to that, I wanted to go back to this blood where lymphatic capillaries pretty much go to the subclavian veins, which will eventually drain into the right atrium again. Now, dealing with respiration, which is what we're really looking at, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. I actually start want you to follow a air as it goes through. And so the first thing we have is we have the nares. And inside the nares, we can see hairs. These will help catch large particles and prevent them from going into the nasal cavity. As we go into the nasal cavity, we see that you have the septum and you have the three nasal concha. Nasal concha now are covered by epithelium and they have capillaries. And what happens is as air comes in here, it causes a turbulence in air, and that turbulence makes the air come into contact with more of the epithelial lining. This epithelial lining has goblet cells which pr produce mucus, so whatever's in the air will actually come in contact with some of this mucus, and a lot of the small particles will be trapped in there, uh, some more than others. You can see the uh, hard palate here, the ethmoid bone here, and so... Going into the tissue, we have a new type of tissue. I took this image from Ken Hub, uh, which I said it was okay. And what you see is you have these long cells which look like they're stratified, but they're not. So we call, and they also have hair-like projections here called cilia. And so we call them ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Underneath it, you will have capillaries. And that's important for what's gonna happen in the nasal cavity. There's actually an area of the lungs, the uh, respiratory tract called the conducting zone. And this is sometimes referred to as anatomical dead space. This does not mean it's not needed. It just means that there is no gas exchange. And what's happening there, though, is air is being warmed, it's being filtered, and it's being humidified. Now, you may ask, how is all this happening? Well, if you think of the capillaries, it has blood, and blood tends to be warmer than the outside air. And so the warmth of the blood can actually warm the air that enters the respiratory or conducting zone. It also has water which can cross the capillaries and humidify the air so the air isn't, doesn't hit your lungs extremely dry. And the mucus from the goblet cells can help filter it. And so that's how this is accomplished. Now, as we go down, we can actually see the trachea here and we can see it has these rings, tracheal rings. At the end, it actually branches and it gives you two bronchus. So primary bronchus will end up forming at the end of the trachea, and you'll notice that this one tends to be, actually this one's uh, the, uh, this is actually flipped upside backwards, this guy has citrus and versus, because the right side should have three, one, two, three, and the left should actually only have one. This one flipped it around for some reason, but the trachea we should have two bronchus here, coming off here, secondary bronchus, and on the left side, you should have, on the right side, you should have three. The reason is you need space for the heart. And you can tell that this is the wrong side because of the aorta moving this way. So over here, we can see it a little better. You can see how the heart lies here. And so you have a little bit of an, less of a steep angle on the right side than on the left. On the lungs, you can see that you have a fissure coming this way and another fissure coming across this way. And so we can talk about the superior, middle and inferior lungs of the lobe. And you can also talk about the horizontal fissure and the oblique fissure. Over on the right side again, you only have the 
oblique fissure. Again, it has to do with the heart. You do have an area where the heart is called the cardiac notch or the uh, cardiac impression. And you have an area that kind of of the superior lobe of the left side, which wraps around the heart looking almost like a tongue, which we call it a lingula. It's the superior that has a lingula. Okay, now we talked about the trachea and how we get into the lungs. Now, inside the lung, the lungs are actually covered by a membrane called the pleura. And the pleura has two layers. The part that touches the lungs itself is called the visceral layer. The one that's on top is called the uh, parietal layer. And it leaves a little cavity in here called the uh, pleural cavity. Now, what usually happens is the diaphragm contracts, causing it to flatten, which ends up pulling down on the lungs. What this does is it increases the volume, which decreases the pressure. As the pressure on the outside of the, the nasal cavity is even because it's outside, air will rush into the trachea and the bronchus to fill up the lungs. When the diaphragm relaxes, there's actually elastic fibers in the lungs which pull the diaphragm back up, decreasing the volume, thus increasing the pressure, so air will leave. So over here we can actually see the uh, respiratory tree, the bronchial, so we have the trachea, the main bronchus, the secondary bronchus, segmental bronchus, the bronchioles, and every time these go through, you'll notice that these rings here, which, and plates, which are cartilage, highland cartilage, they get less and less. And so at the end, we actually don't have the cartilage anymore, but we do have smooth muscle. Once we get to this area, it's called the respiratory zone. And that's actually where we want to talk about. The respiratory bronchioles are attached to alveolar sacs. And between them, you have these alveolar ducts, which the sacs actually become. What happens is the alveolar sacs are kind of these round per circular projections. And between them, you have an area that connects them called the alveolar ducts. So the sacs would be the round things I'm drawing here. So this would be a sac. And the duct would be the area in here. Again, the alveoli is where gas exchange takes place. The diaphragm contracts, it causes a stretch, and as you have elastic tissues, elastic fibers in there, it's going to cause it to stretch, and when the diaphragm contract, relaxes, it's going to cause a recoil. Over here, we can actually see the flat, simple cells of the alveolar sacs, and what happens is, as it's one cell layer thick, it does allow for diffusion of molecules such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, it also allows for water to be able to leave. That's why when you breathe out, you'll notice it's usually moist. Now, this is a picture I got from Frank Netter. It's an old picture. Uh, and what you see is, besides a normal respiration, the diaphragm, you have muscles of forced respiration. Now, a lot of these muscles are used to a small degree when you're breathing quietly. But when you're actually breathing heavily, you can see these accessory muscles. Now, you can look here you have the sternum clavicle so the sternocleidomastoid and you have the scalenes group which are going to pull the chest up and by pulling the chest up again it increases volume and so it decreases pressure so you can breathe in easier so these are muscles of force inspiration found in the neck you do have the um, um, serratus muscles which are also used and then when you want to breathe out more than usual what you'll use is you'll use this rectus abdominis transverse abdominis internal and external obliques, and you'll be able to put more pressure inside the abdomin abdominal cavity, which will push up on the diaphragm, helping you push air out. Now, I don't remember where I found this. It's an old picture I, I have, but when you're qu breathing quietly, you have this area here. This is your normal diaphragmatic breathing. Air comes in and out in a tidal volume, and that's usually what you're doing when you're sitting relaxing. When you start needing more area, you can breathe in more than usual, which is called your inspiratory reserve volume. It's the amount of air you can breathe in on top of what you normally do when sitting or lying down. You also have more air than you can breathe out under normal circumstances. So you have a lot of area, which is called uh, reserve volume, 
which you can use when you're increasing your activity. So you won't necessarily just breathe your normal tidal volume. If you're actively breathing, actively working, you might go beyond that. You may end up using even everything that you, your entire uh, vital capacity. And the way you do that is for inspiration, you use your muscles of inspiration, force inspiration, for expiration, you use your muscles of force expiration. And so you can use more of this. Now there are some clinical cases I want to talk about, and one of them is asthma. In asthma, the bronchial spasms, they have smooth muscle, which can end up spasming, and the pseudociliated columnar epithelium, the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium, well, can actually over secrete mucus. And so you can end up having too much mucus and smaller bronchioles, which will end up leading to a restrictive airway disease. It makes it harder to get air in and out, and it actually changes the pressure. Now, if you have this long term, you can actually end up getting chronic bronchitis, usually due to smoking. You can get a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which can be either obstructive or it can also be something like emphysema, which doesn't allow you to breathe out, which means you've lost your elasticity. So you have to use a lot of other things. Now, this can be due mainly due to smoking, but there have been links with air pollution and there is a genetic factor to it. There are some people who have alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is a recognized genetic condition that can end up getting emphysema. These two, not, not due to smoking. This uh, smoking can, can cause this. It destroys the elastic tissues. And so air is trapped in the lungs. You can't get it out. And so what ends up happening is you try to push air out by muscles of force expiration. You can't breathe it in. You can't get the air out, you can bring it in, but you can't get it out. So you tense and you pretty much will use your respiratory muscles as well, other respiratories. The chronic bronchitis is the other one we call, it is associated with smoking. It, you, people refer to them as blue bloaters because it changes the pressure. They can't get the air and so they bloat, it causes edema. Uh, bronchus and bronchioles become inflamed. They, that's actually part of the reason why smokers have a plate so they can spit into it. And it causes increased pressure on the right side of the heart, leading a backup in circulation, which will end up increasing venous pressure. And so it will end up causing more edema. You do have pneumothorax, which what happens is there's a puncture in the wall of the thorax. And so air gets into the lung cavity and it doesn't allow the airs to the lungs to work normally. What ends up happening is when you breathe, it may cause air to move in and out of the thoracic area or it can even become a tension pneumothorax, which a puncture worm adds a flap. And so air comes in, it goes into the thoracic cavity instead of the lungs. And then when you try to breathe out, it closes a flap. So it builds up pressure. Uh, and it will end up causing pressure of in the heart. And you can see a lot of this by, because the veins become really prominent. And so we, when we're dealing with uh, cardiovascular from the right atrium, right atrium to the right ventricle, It'll go to the pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries. You'll notice these are blue. And it'll go to the lungs where oxygen will come in, carbon dioxide and water will leave, which will actually end up decreasing the blood, uh, increasing blood pH. It decreases the oxygen levels. Well, I hope you enjoyed this and have a nice day.